th th thank, thank you for that background. Um, and that's perfect because um, that's, yeah, yeah, I, I think some of the question marks there are exactly some of the things that I, that, that I, that I want to cover today. So what I'm thinking is I probably have like 20, 25, 30 minutes or so worth of content. And then what I figure is I can share that and then we can, you know, more than happy to do like any Q&A and go as deep as, as, as people would like to go. So um, that sounds perfect. Yeah, let me, let's do it. Um, cool. Uh, uh, Preeti, do you see my screen? Yeah, we see it. Perfect. Okay, cool. Yeah, so um, I just discovered what YGMI meant uh, a couple of days ago, and I thought it was sort of a good title for this presentation. Um, I remember when I, I did this thing called Recurse Center a couple of years ago, and I remember thinking to myself, wow, everyone here like knows so much, and I, someone just pulled me aside, they said like, oh, well, you'll figure it out, you're going to make it. So I figure with this, I kind of want to relay that, um, you know, both those thoughts, but also those feelings over just because I think, um, yeah, everyone is going to do uh, great. So let's get started. Um, a couple of, you know, like broad themes of what I think it takes to become productive and uh, good as a Solidity developer. And bear in mind, I'm sharing this, like this is like N equals one. There are probably lots of other ways to become good and productive, but this is roughly what I've learned both Solidity, but also in the past uh, doing a lot, you know, Python, Ruby, Golang, lots of other languages and having worked for a while. Um, I worked uh, most recently at Coinbase for about three years. I led the new asset edition group. Um, essentially, what we did there is that for before our group, we, uh, Coinbase supported just Bitcoin and Ethereum. After our group, uh, Coinbase supports Bitcoin, Ethereum, and like any other asset. So you can uh, thank me and my team for uh, Coinbase supporting XRP and, you know, just kidding, also all these other uh, great assets that we now support. But uh, yeah, so that's a bit about me, but let's talk about uh, coding and programming. So uh, number one, meet your neighbor. So what do I mean by that? Uh, can I click here? Yes, perfect. So here's the thing, right? Like when you, when you start going deep into Solidity and you start going deep into Ethereum, it probably feels like it's the matrix. Like there are all these things going on. There are all these opcodes, all this stuff on this chain, all these reorgs, all this uh, MEV. But really think of it more like an abacus more than anything else. Um, if you know how an abacus works, you know everything you need to know to understand how the EVM actually works. And this is a broad theme in this presentation, which is as soon as you decide on your mental models and like how you wanna think about the EVM and think about your tools, uh, the faster you'll become uh, productive. Uh, next thing I wanna talk about is when it comes to developing and actually like having your mental models, um, I caution against developing in a vacuum. What does it mean to develop in a vacuum? Um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this meme. It's like, if someone says, oh, I need a fence and they kind of make a fence. It's like, yeah, literally this is a fence. Okay, but like, is it really serving its purpose? Is it really doing what like it needs to do? Um, or the other huh, weird, I had a, sorry, this, there were a couple of other pictures on the slide that didn't necessarily show up. Hang on, let me, uh, yeah, there were a couple of other pictures for some reason they didn't show up quite here, they, that they didn't show up here. Actually, I can, I'll just pull them up. Um, this is one of the fun things about doing Zoom presentations. Like when I talk about developing in a vacuum, when I, like I was, I was doing something in GraphQL a couple of weeks ago and I saw this thing, it's like, oh, interesting. There's a plugin for adding text to GraphQL code gen. And I started looking into it and it's like, oh, this is interesting. And I saw like this code snippet over here and something about this is like kind of rubbed me the wrong way. And what I realized, it's kind of like developing in a vacuum where basically if the only vacuum you have is being able to write a plugin uh, and you need to make a plugin to just add text, you'll have like a bunch of YAML and a bunch of like, I don't know, a bunch of like framework and a bunch of stuff to do something that's actually pretty simple. And this is an example of like developing in a vacuum. So when you can avoid doing that, uh, it's, it's good. Um, what is going on with my slide deck? Cool. Um, another example of your neighbors is it's important to get to know your development uh, stacks. So um, I, I imagine if you guys have done smart contract stuff, you've probably looked into some framework. Maybe it's uh, hard hat or maybe it's brownie. I think it's really, really important to get comfortable with these tools because these tools will make you more productive or will make you less productive. And if you, you know, get good at them and you kind of learn how they work, things that'll take other people, you know, days to do, you'll be able to do in like minutes. Because uh, you'll know how to write scripts, you'll know how to like write tools, and you'll know how to you'll know how to make your frameworks like work for you instead of against you. And I think that's a really exciting thing that people can do. 
Um, another example is a lot of smart contracts these days use uh, Open Zeppelin uh, and some of their contracts. Um, I think a really good exercise, for example, would, would be to like look through the main smart contracts that you use and actually like read the contract source code. It sounds like a very obvious thing to say, but not that many people in tech actually read the code of the libraries that their code relies on. Um, I think that it's like everyone talks about how to be like a 10x or 100x engineer. I think that in smart contracts today, uh, like really, really good is being able to like implement a smart contract that your contract relies on from memory or just understanding how it works just because, um, yeah, exactly. The best engineers read a lot more code than, uh, than they write. Um, yeah, so here's the thing. And it's, I think that reading code is sort of like uh, getting uh, in, in good shape. I used to think a lot about, oh, how does one actually get into like really good shape? What's one actually supposed to do? And um, that's so weird. The, uh, I, had a, I had an animation here that didn't show up, but since this is 2020 and this is Zoom, I can uh, pull it up here. There we go. How to level up and write better code. Yeah, the way to actually learn to write better code is to make it really easy to read code. Um, this is an example of something that I was working on a long time ago. I was using some uh, Python crypto library and like I didn't really know what it was doing. So you can just like command click on something if you use VS code and I'm sure you can do it in any other editor as well. And like the beauty of these uh, scripting languages that we use is that you can just like click in and you can actually see what the library is actually doing. Um, this sounds really obvious because this is like a three second uh, GIF or GIF. I don't even, I don't remember. I don't know how the cool kids pronounce it these days, but like, this is a really big deal. Um, if we were doing this in other languages, you'd have like dynamically linked libraries and you'd have like this binary code. But in most languages today, like whether you're using TypeScript or Python or Ruby, it's so easy. You can literally just like command click and see what your thing is doing. So if more people realize that, Stack Overflow wouldn't exist. And Stack Overflow is like one of the most important things in the software engineering industry. Um, Cause like, instead of reading the docs or instead of like asking other people, you can just see what something is doing underneath the hood. And I don't know, when I discovered this, it was, it was a huge, huge moment for me because I realized like, I don't really have any more questions cause I can just figure things out. Um, there we go. Okay, cool. So. All that stuff that I just said, I said that like code isn't, uh, you know, it shouldn't be that tricky to understand. So this is a bunch of Ethereum bytecode. And I don't know, it's like, it, it's it, it's early for me over here. I look at this and I, it's like my stomach turns a little bit. Like when I look at this, what do I see? What Like I've been coding for a long time, since I was like 15 and I've held like pretty senior engineering positions. I see this, my code, my, my stomach turns. And I think to myself, like, like, what the hell is this? Like, I didn't study computer science. I don't know any of this. Like, what do I really, really know about, you know, what am I doing here? Blah, 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 imposter syndrome. But like, if we want to think of it with a positive attitude, like let's just look at it piece by piece, bird by bird. So let's start looking. So, okay, 60, 80, 60, 40, 52. What does that mean? Okay, well, 60, 80 is to push something onto the stack. 60, 40 is to push another thing onto the stack and 52 is M store. Okay, so like literally, this stuff here, it's it's actually like available for anybody to figure out and read. And the only limiting factor is whether you're willing to uh, feel uh, stumped long enough until you figure it out. That's like the only thing getting in the way because everything else is there and available for us, right? Um, all of the, uh, what's it called? All the opcodes are like widely available. If you Google like EVM opcodes, you can find a list of anything you need. If you look for the Ethereum white paper, which mind you, you don't need a license to get, you don't need to pay for it. It's just there on GitHub for you to read. Um, all, everything we need is there. So something like this isn't actually that scary anymore. Like this is, this is like what we do. And this is kind of available for us to like make sense of and parse. And we don't need any degrees. We don't need any licenses. We don't need any certifications. You just have to be willing to like read code long enough to figure it out and figure out how, how it all works. Um, next. Okay. Two, summer and winter. So um, whether you're new to crypto or not, um, th th there's this common thing people would talk about. Actually, people at Coinbase would talk about this quite a bit. They would say like, oh, when is crypto summer happening? When are we going to get outside of crypto winter? And like, there's just this metaphor about the weather and where crypto is going to go. And I think it's, it's an okay metaphor, but it's, I think it's sort of like problematic and like it's sort of a learned helplessness thing. Cause when people say like, when is crypto summer starting? 
uh, my answer is, well, in crypto, like builders decide what the weather is going to be. Um, we don't have to like wait to see where the market goes. We don't have to see like what's going to happen. We make things happen. Um, is it going to be sunny today? Like that's why weather is a bad metaphor because we literally decide like what the, what's going to happen. We can choose to release something cool. We can choose to share something with the world. So it's like really our decision what the weather is actually going to be here. Um, to take it even further, like in the old world, let's say you wanted to build like, you know, financial primitives or you wanted to build financial constructs. What do you do? Number one, you have to be born into the right family. So that's like, that's kind of like a luck thing that you can't really pick. Number two, you have to like go to the right prep schools. You have to go to like Phillips Exeter. Then you have to go to like a great university because you have to compete with everybody. Then you have to get some experience at like a brand name bank. And only then have you earned the, uh, you know, the right to help other people take their companies public. Only then have you earned your seat at the table to, uh, I don't know, be a part of the financial system. And I don't know, I used to look at that. I'm fascinated by finance, but that used to piss me off a little bit because me, like I'm, I'm a Middle Eastern guy, like in the States. And like, I don't know, I didn't go to the, I didn't go to the right schools. I didn't go to prep school. I just played with GitHub a lot. And I think now is such a unique time in history because like today, if you want to do all that stuff, all you have to do is just start writing some code. Obviously there's like more stuff you have to do along the way, but basically all of those things that people had to spend 20, 25, 30 years of their life doing before, um, if you can use Git and you can write code, you can do all of those things now. So in crypto, we decide the weather, we decide our fate, we decide our fortune. It's really all in our hands, which is pretty exciting. Um, and when we think about like how to actually do it, it's not as simple as it sounds. Um, I gave this talk a little bit ago that explained um, how I wrote the, the Uniswap V3 staker. Um, and I sort of did like the step-by-step -step thing of like, I started off wanting to make something for Uniswap V3. So I needed some libs, so I cloned them. And I needed some more code, then I cloned it, then some sources, blah, 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 blah. And like all this, you know, kind of annoying stuff happens um, along the way. Let's see, there we go. Oh yeah, and then there were like more things that worked than I thought would get sub-modules. Basically all of this stuff happens in between um, wanting to do something and actually being able to do something. And it sounds really difficult and this sounds like a big task because it is, but I promise you like learning how to do all of this is something you can do in a couple of days. Whereas everything that, that you needed to do in the old world to actually take something public was much, much, much harder and much, much longer. And it's something you didn't have control over. So yeah, we decide what the weather is. We decide what we wanna tolerate and what we wanna, what we wanna deal with. Okay, next. Um, this section over here, what do you think it should be? It's an interesting question. Um, this is like sort of engineering stuff, but this is also something I read in a Tony Robbins book a little while ago. And more and more I'm realizing that like after a certain point, everyone knows the same code, everyone has the same libraries and it's more your mindset and the questions you ask and how you think about things. So um, what do you think something should be? What do I mean by that? So let's say you're building something and um, to compile your code, it takes 45 seconds. Is that good or is that bad? And if you think about that a little bit, like, I, I don't know, I can't really tell you. you, you sort of have to decide for yourself. Um, it helps though to know some top-down numbers. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen, if people have seen this before, but there's this, this famous thing, common latency numbers that engineers should know. So like an L1 cache reference takes like a nanosecond and then branch miss uh, predicts you know, so on. And it basically just like steps it up and it shows you every single thing that you can do on a computer, how long it takes. So we have that blue scale, which is, which is hundred nanoseconds. And then it shows you, okay, if you want to compress a kilobyte, uh, kilobyte of data, two microseconds, then 10 microseconds is a green block. We look at those green blocks and it talks about, okay, if you want to do these things, this is how it takes. Like SSDs are pretty fast, but a random read is going to take you 16 microseconds. Round trips in data centers, 500 microseconds. And we get to one, uh, sorry, uh, these are micro, this is one millisecond. We look at that. Now we get into really, really slow things like reading a thousand uh, million bytes from an, uh, what's it called, from an SSD. Then we get to things like packet round trips from California to the Netherlands. And mind you, we're still talking about like 150 milliseconds here. Um, this is really, really long compared to everything that we've looked at before. Um, but then we think about, okay, what if we want to do an NPM install? How long does that take? I, I, ran, I ran an NPM install on like a quad core i9 processor yesterday. It took 30 seconds. Um, so remember like we're, we're literally sending something to the Netherlands from California and back it takes 150 milliseconds. And we think about doing an NPM install and how long that actually takes. I'm not, 
I'm not trying to be mean to like any ecosystems. I'm not trying to like insult anybody's work, but like when we think about how long something could be and how long it should be and how long it actually takes, there's a huge gap between um, where things are and what they could be. And really like the only speed limit is like the speed of light. So until the point that you run NPM install and like it goes faster than the speed of light, there's like more work that can be done. Um, and I sort of, I, I, I encourage everyone to think about uh, those things as their limits because it's tempting to look at npm and say oh i can make this tool 10 percent faster okay that's cool we can do a bunch of incremental improvements but if you want to get if you want to think about really big things it's interesting to think about like what's actually going on like at the wire what's what's the computer actually doing and how can i make that what's like the theoretical speed limit here that we're actually dealing with yeah um because if something feels slow, you sort of need to say like, you know, why does it actually feel slow? Like, let's say you're using a, a calculator and you told it one plus one equals, and it took 20 seconds to say that the answer is two, like you would know something is wrong. And the reason why you'd know something is wrong is because you have a mental model of how calculators should work. Calculators shouldn't take, you know, 30 seconds to do a simple addition. Um, whether it's okay for NPM to like take forever to install something or any package manager, um, kind of given that example, it's it's really up to you. And ultimately, it's really based on your mental model of what's going on. And remember, like everything we're doing here, like computers, they're just, they're, it's just like a slightly more complicated abacus. So there's no reason why things should be slow. There's no reason why something should make you wait. Um, I think about this a lot. Like if you deal with, if like you're working on a problem and there's a tool that sucks, you you really only have two choices. You can either make it better or you can lower your standards. And it's totally okay to lower your standards. It's okay to say, you know, this build tool takes uh, 10 minutes to build something that I think can take 10 seconds, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna like solve this challenge. And that's absolutely okay, but it's completely in your power to like make tools better. Um, and I think that matters quite a bit. There's uh, this book that I read to my daughter uh, like every single day, it's called, Oh, the Places You'll Go by Dr. Seuss. And he talks about this place called The Waiting Place. And I think about that a lot and uh, right now, I think that he's actually talking about um, uh, Ethereum developer tools because there's this place where like you're, it's like you're good, you're able to write code, but like you're just waiting on your tools to finish. You're waiting for someone to like answer your uh, GitHub issue. You're waiting for a pull request to land. You're waiting for a security audit. Eventually, you realize like, wow, people around me know. It, 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 basically, everyone around you, even the people who you think know a lot, they know pretty much exactly as much as you do. They just sat with problems longer. So yeah, um, the way you get out of the waiting place is you decide that you want to get out of it. The way that you make it crypto summer is you make it crypto summer. The way that you get, you know, the way that you get like 100x better dev tools is you make dev tools that are 100x better. Um, yeah, it's really in our hands. And I find that to be really, really exciting. Um, okay, next section is broad predictors of success. This is going to seem like a little bit of a hodgepodge, but these are things that, um, sound really simple, but I found tend to correlate really well with people building uh, great things. Um, this first one, uh, this is this is a speeding ticket. I hope not that many of you here have gotten a speeding ticket, but uh, I, I wanna tell you a quick story about this and I promise this is gonna relate to a predictor of success. A couple of years ago, uh, I think I was 17. I was, uh, when I was living with my parents, um, I got a speeding ticket. And I was really afraid because my dad kept, would always tell me like, don't speed, don't speed, don't speed. And there you go. I got a speeding ticket going 83 and a 65. And the reason I'm telling you the story is because when I got home and I told my dad that I got a speeding ticket, you know, I went, I, I, I got home and of all things my dad could be doing, he was actually cleaning his rifle because he was out hunting that day. So it's like, oh, great. This is going to be fun. So I told him, yeah, you know, dad, I got a speeding ticket. And he says, uh, what was your speeding ticket for? And my, my answer was, the car was doing 83 and a 65. Um, and I remember he just gave me this look and it took me a while to realize why he gave me that look, but that's because those were because of the words that I chose. Instead of saying I was driving 83, I said the car was doing 83 and a 65. And okay, let's bring this back to predictors of success. When, when the computer does something and it surprises you, you sort of have two choices. You can either say the computer surprised me or you can say, where was it? 
sorry, this, this slide didn't, uh, didn't come out the way that I thought it was going to. Basically, when the computer does something that surprises you, you can say, the computer surprised me, or I told the computer to do something that surprised me. Um, or it's kind of like when, when mishaps happen, some people say mistakes were made, some people say we made mistakes. Um, and those words, those decisions, those choices really decide uh, how far you're gonna go because one of them is, oh, this computer is doing something and I don't really get it and I, I don't know. The other one says like, the computer is deterministic. The computer is basically just a really fast abacus. So if the computer did something that I didn't expect it to do, it's not like the ghost of chaos came into my computer and like, you know, did something surprising. No, I just did something, I just didn't realize it. So it's a problem that's within my control completely. Um, and maybe it's not something you wrote, maybe it's a framework or a library that did something surprising. Great, go back to that slide about reading the code because you can read the code for every library you use. So theoretically, like every single thing that the computer is gonna do is available. All you have to do is click in and be curious enough to read about it. Um, other things that I think are really important, um, when you go and you start uh, working on a project, I find that the time to first release is extremely important. Um, I did this project a couple of months ago. Uh, uh, here we go. Yeah, I built this thing. It's the uh, the staker contract for Uniswap v3. I'm really proud of the fact that when I that it started off as Omar Uniswap staker, now it's Uniswap Uniswap staker. Um, these the, 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 these are my small wins. Uh, but uh, time to first release. This project took us about two months to do, but we got our first release out in about a week. And that release was like full of bugs. It was unaudited. There were so many embarrassing bugs. If anybody used it, they would have lost all their money, but that's okay because we shared something. We said, you know, this is not ready for production, but we got something out there. Um, I find that with any project, no matter how long it takes, the longer you spend um, before getting a first release out, the less likely you are to actually ship it in the end. I think the way to do it is to always have something out there and always be making something better instead of trying to make something perfect. Um, the next thing, time to first surprise. This is gonna sound a little bit obvious, but uh, one of the reasons why TypeScript is really popular, if you ask a computer science professor or you ask anyone who's, uh, who's really deep in TypeScript why it's good, they're gonna say TypeScript is great because of generic type systems and monads and interfaces and classes and you know, functional programming and you know, blah, 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 all the stuff that's gonna make your eyes glaze over. In my opinion, TypeScript is really great because it's a, it's a surprise minimization framework. What that means is that if you're just using JavaScript uh, and you have a bug in your code, you're gonna to have to compile your code, you're gonna to have to run it, you're gonna to have to get to that uh, code block and then you're gonna run into the error. And it's gonna take maybe 10, 15 seconds to surprise you. But with things like TypeScript, if there's a bug, uh, VS Code will like underline the error and it'll let you know before you even compile your code. Um, in absolute terms, like, this isn't that big of a difference. Like we're talking about with you know regular uh, you know JavaScript, 15 seconds. With TypeScript, we're talking about 100 milliseconds. So what? That's like 15 seconds. Who cares? Yeah, but this is really like the life of a of, of like a programmer. You're just gonna you know keep making mistakes mistakes and keep fixing them. So it's not like 15 seconds versus 100 milliseconds. It's more like 15 hours versus 10 minutes. Um, these small things really, 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 really compound. So whenever you can find things that mean uh, you minimize your time to first surprise, I highly suggest you uh, try them out. Uh, another example is time to find a bug. Um, I, was, I, I worked at this one company a long time ago and uh, the CTO asked me to go uh, hang out with one of the other teams that I didn't know a ton about them, but I knew that they were sort of like constantly struggling, constantly missing ship dates, constantly behind on things. And it really surprised me because it was like on paper, a very, very intelligent team. Like everyone had built like good stuff in the past. Everyone had worked on previous good teams and I couldn't quite figure out what was wrong. So I just hung out with them for a while and I just started pair programming with people. And there was this one, there was out of everything that I saw, there was one thing that I found most surprising. And it was the fact that in order for that team to boot up a console, this was that their main product was a Rails app. In order for them to boot up a console, it would take 30 seconds to start the console, right? This, this was Ruby on Rails. So if I said like Rails console, literally like wait 30 seconds and then your console is ready. Um, I, could do, I could do like a, like a 30 seconds of silence to kind of illustrate how long 30 seconds is. But remember, it's not like 30 seconds just one time. It's 30 seconds times every time you wanna change something. And our job is to change stuff and build stuff. So that's like a tax on your productivity. Um, 
Yeah. So if it takes you that long to find bugs, you're probably not going to find bugs. If it takes you, you know, three hours to run a test suite, you're probably not going to add that many tests. If it takes you a second to boot up your test suite, you're probably going to write a lot more tests. Um, to take that really far, this project that I did, this Uniswap staker, um, from the eight weeks that it took us to write, I think two and a half weeks was me just learning how to make the test suite start in a second in, instead of in 30 seconds. Um, and that actually compounds quite a bit because when you maintain a package like this, it's not just you, it's also anybody who wants to contribute to your package as well. So these things really, really, really multiply. Um, if we go back to thinking about the theoretical maximums, like there's no reason why your test suite should take such a long time to boot up. It should just work. Like our computers are so powerful. We put a man on the moon with like a megabyte of memory. Our computers today have like 16, 32 gigabytes of memory. We have ridiculous computing power available. So invest a little bit like in your tooling, invest a little bit in your process and invest a bit in your productivity and like the genius will follow from there, at least from my experience. Because I, I don't know, I never thought of myself as like, you know, smart enough to have a genius breakthrough, but I thought of myself as impatient enough to like fix stuff that sucks. And just doing a lot of good stuff over and over again is, is, is sort of the key. Um, yeah, I gave this example, time to boot the test suite. This is just like time to boot a console. If it takes you a long time to boot a test suite, you know, like good luck. If you can run your test suite right away, awesome. You'll build uh, things that are significantly better. Um, yeah, so I guess time-wise, we're about at the 30 minute mark right now. Um, I'm not sure if, 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 if folks sort of came into this presentation expecting me to say like, yeah, the master cheat code is like left, right, left, right, up, down, up, down. Really, I think the way, to, the, like, the way to become a productive developer is to be impatient, to know the theoretical limits and just like relentlessly make stuff better. If you do that, you will, you'll you know, have time to put in the reps. If you make it really easy to read the code, you'll understand how everything works. If you have good mental models of how you know, the things above, uh, maybe like web3.js, the things below like EVM bytecode, the things adjacent like uh, you know, node modules or hard hat or ETH brownie, if you understand how like those neighbors work, you'll get really, really, really far. Um, this is still a very nascent field. People are still sort of catching on. So that's great because that means you're early, but at the same time, that means a lot of the uh, frameworks and tooling out there is still a, a little bit immature. Um, some people look at that and they say, oh, maybe I should wait a few more years. I look at that, I say, great, this is our opportunity to make great things for ourselves and for others. So um, yeah, that, that sort of concludes the, the presentation part of, of, of what I have to share. Um, and yeah, I'm more than happy to take uh, questions, talk through anything, Essentially, I'm, I'm an open book available to everybody here. Happy to answer any questions that, uh, that, that you all might have. Thanks, Omar. That was really, really amazing and inspirational. We see some hands up. So if you have questions, just put your hand up and we'll go in order as usual. Um, Akash, you want to go first? Thanks, Omar. Very inspiring presentation. Really appreciate that. Um, my question is, there are we're, we're in such a nascent field as you mentioned and there are a ton of different avenues that we can take to build new stuff in web3 and make an impact for someone that's newer to the space that can i guess be a little bit overwhelming you know i'm definitely it's going to take me several levels to get to the point where i could do something like building uniswap v3 staker um, what but i'm also like a big proponent of like building a momentum getting small wins and letting that avalanche what do you think is the best way to start doing that is it to to try to contribute to open source or to to find a job in a crypto company i'm just curious to hear your perspective there yeah absolutely um a couple of things came to mind. One of them is, so, so you, you mentioned there being like several levels between sort of, sort of where you perceive you are and, and what you perceive it takes to like, like to build the staker. I would um, be wary of that notion because um, it's, because we don't have any like degrees or diplomas or, or, or certifications here. It's just a matter of um, building, you know, experience and, and familiarity with tooling. Um, I think one good thing to do would be 
to ask yourself, like, what's the most interesting thing that I think is going on in crypto right now? Let's say uh, the answer were was uh, uh, crypto punks. What I would suggest is just go like really, really deep into it. Actually, like read the source code from start to finish and kind of challenge yourself to rewrite uh, crypto punks from scratch. Um, and then you'll do that. And then, OK. And I would also suggest time boxing these projects and say, I'm going to spend at most uh, four hours doing this because you can get really, really, really far in uh, you know just a couple of hours of just deep focus time. Um, if you make time to do stuff like that, OK, you'll have a great idea of how CryptoPunks works. Um, and then maybe a few days later, you'll say, OK, now I'm really curious about how, I don't know, you're in finance works. So I'm going to pick like this vault and I'm going to read the contract from start to finish. And then I'm going to try and make my own version of that. Um, you know, do that and time box out to like eight hours and then say, OK, now I want to make a contract that does this. And I would say, all right, I'm going to time box that to, that to eight hours. So the, the theme I'm trying to get to is like find things that you think are interesting to you, because the best way to work on something isn't to force yourself to work on it. It's to like do stuff that you find is, is interesting. Um, just like think about that and then just start going a little bit deeper into those things specifically. Just start going a little bit deeper into those fields and just have a deliverable. That's another cool thing. Um, I found that when I started writing blog posts, I started um, learning things better. The reason why was because I just challenged myself to write blog posts about something. So um, when you make products, like when you make something like the staker, it's cool because you have a deliverable. When you say, I'm just going to read the CryptoPunk source code and write my own, the deliverable there is, okay, just make your own version of CryptoPunks. And when you do that, you know, 100 people on Twitter are going to say, this is stupid. This is just like CryptoPunks. But like, that doesn't matter because your goal was to make something that's your own. So just focus on like making stuff, releasing stuff um, on stuff that like is time box, just rinse and repeat. And next thing you know, you'll be like making really, really epic stuff. Um, in terms of joining a crypto company, I think it's good to do that. Um, I think that whether you choose to just like do everything, you know, sort of on your own or with a team of people informally or join a company, you will, no matter what, you're going to have to learn how to teach yourself things and how to like have good questions and answer them. Um, and I think that that'll make you more productive, both as, uh, you know, an independent builder and as an individual contributor. I think the best people I worked with at Coinbase were ones where I could say, here's a problem and they could figure out everything around it. So that's something that I would invest in no matter what. Awesome. Um, Joshua? Hey, Omar. Great presentation uh, to echo everybody else. Uh, earlier, you mentioned... Uh, it's, you know, a very wise decision to like really learn the mental models for things like hard hat, EVM bytecode, Web3, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I was curious if there were any particular ones that stood out to you that, you know, maybe you rammed your head against them for a few weeks and then you stumbled onto some key detail and you're like, oh, what are some of those key details? Yeah, absolutely. 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 Um, uh, Hat. There's this thing. Are you familiar with hard hat? A little bit. Just okay. learned it a few days ago. Okay. Um, one nice thing about it, I think it was in hard hat. Let me try to remember exactly what it was. Uh, there was so in, in doing the Uniswap Staker contract, uh, we, we, we we have a pretty big test suite. I think the contract itself is like 300 lines of code. The test suite is, I think, like 2,000 lines of code. There's a crazy ratio of like you know, lines of test code to lines of solidity. And um, whenever I would run the test suite, it would actually take like, like 75 seconds or something to run two or three test cases. And I couldn't quite figure out why. And I read somewhere that like Hard Hat has a unique and complex, uh, what, did it, what did they call it? They called it like a, text, a, a test fixture runtime environment add on some more like words. It, it didn't have the word cloud or big data in it, but it was just like enough words that like I looked at it and I'm just like, whoa, this is outside of my wheelhouse. I have no idea what like what the hell this actually is. So every time the test suite would take forever to run, I was like, oh, I don't know. This must be like the hard hat test fixture runtime environment or whatever. Um, one day, I one week I said I was going to do something and I couldn't get it done by the end of the week. So I just stayed late on Friday, kept working on it. And then it got to like Friday at 11 p.m. and I was so I was so annoyed. I was like, okay, you know, like screw this. I'm gonna learn what this thing actually is. I'm gonna learn what this like fixture runtime environment actually actually is. Um, 
And I did, and lo and behold, it was like 20 lines of code on GitHub. Um, it was a very, very simple thing, which would do, I'm trying to see if I can find it here. Basically all it would do is it would get the EVM to a certain state, it would snapshot it, and then it would save that snapshot in a hash somewhere. It was like nothing more than that. It was like 20 lines. It probably could have been written in like five lines of code. So that's a really good example of like stuff that sounds really complex is actually not, is probably not that complex if you have a good mental model. Um, another good example is uh, it, it, if I say an uh, upgradable proxy contract, like, oh, that sounds like something you probably have to like wear, a, wear like a shirt and tie to like, no, what's an upgradable proxy contract that sounds so serious? Okay, well, if we know that on the blockchain, you can't change a contract once you deploy it, and we know that something is in fact upgradable, so it can change. Well, we're not going to change this code, but we're going to change other codes. So, okay, I guess there's like a pointer somewhere. Okay, so maybe like a, an upgradable proxy contract just means like I point it to a contract, then I can change where it points to. There are like all sorts of things like that, or, or even the idea of like, of, of like yield farming. I was like, yield farming, that must be something that like crazy DeFi people do. I don't know what this means. It's like, oh, okay you generate yield and you like farm and you optimize and you get more and more of it. So basically what I've learned is that like anytime there's anything that sounds um, really, uh, you know, official and complex and whatever, more often than not, it's just like a self-limiting belief more than anything. So what I would suggest you do is just like pick the most obscure complex thing that like you've learned this week, pick like something that you think sort of seems like a big giant black box that like does all these things and we don't really know how it works. And then just spend a couple of hours just like, writing down on paper, like this is how it actually works. Um, a good example would be, um, this, is, this, this might sound like a tall ask, but like, ask, like, like, like you should be able to write a blog post that explains exactly how the EVM works and you should be able to write a blog, yeah, basically just like write a blog post saying like, you know, this is me implementing the EVM step by step by step. It's kind of, it might be kind of a tricky thing to do, but, I guarantee at every step, you'll always like have the next question. It's like, okay, what is the EVM? Okay, it's a virtual machine. How do I build a virtual machine? Well, it's just like a bunch of like bytes of data and like instructions on how to manipulate and how to, how, and how to operate on it. So just like almost treat that as an infinite loop. Just like have a big question and just like kind of chip at it step by step until, and I guarantee that if you do that, the answers are all there and you'll be able to build some pretty epic things if you just do it that way. Because remember, there's like no uh, magic spell. Everything is completely deterministic and all the answers are there for you to read. It's all open source code. It's all available. Um, that was sort of a rant. I apologize. It's, it's, it's sort of early on my side. Did, did that, did that answer your question? Is that what you were, what you were sort of asking? Um, I did like the rant. Uh, it feels answered. So I'll give you props for that. Um, if nobody else has another question, um, I was curious about, you have a, a blog post about flash loans that I read. And it, one of the things that stood out to me was you said that leverage can actually make the financial system more stable. And that blew my mind. And I was, I would love it if you could elaborate on that. Absolutely. I need to, hang on, I need to pull up that blog post to remember how, to remember, to remember specific, I remember, I remember making that point. I don't remember. Ah, yes. Okay. So with, yeah, um, here we go. I, I think this is a blog post you're talking about and leverage is safety. Okay, so with, uh, these, so with so, so if, if, if you need to take out a regular loan right now or like in, in, in the traditional model of banking, if you need to borrow money, what you do is you like show up to a bank, you convince people like, this is why I am like not a bad credit risk. This is why I promise I'm gonna repay. Um, and the banker either says, yes, I believe you, or no, I don't believe you. And then there's like this term of the loan in which you eventually have to repay it. If you don't repay it, that's bad. The financial system gets like uh, less stable because, uh, you know, more money is owed and there's more bad debt. If you do pay it back, great. That's awesome. Everybody takes their cut. With flash loans, though, you are submitting code that says, I'm going to borrow this money and here's exactly what I'm going to do with it step by step. And I'm going to sign it. And... Uh, you only give me this loan if I am going to repay the funds to you. So there's actually no credit risk when you do a flash loan. So the fact that you say exactly what you're going to do and you actually have to follow through with it is what makes uh, it. It's it's it, it's a way. It's it's basically like a safer way of, of of getting leverage because there's no risk of defaulting on a flash loan, right? Because the flash loan only gets issued if it gets repaid. It's sort of um, 
Inception. It's sort of like the movie Inception, but it's it's a super super cool concept. Got it. Thank you. You know what? This is putting uh, Irvana here. You know, thanks again for coming and uh, and also you know thank you for uh, you know building uh, Uniswap with his taker uh, in the public. Uh, and giving someone like me an opportunity to you know contribute, uh, you know I definitely learned a lot from you know uh, being part of the Telegram group, uh, you know contributing and learning uh, you know all the I mean, looking at all the comments that you were making. Uh, so a couple of questions on that. So you know you know what was the reason you decided to build Uniswap V3 Staker in public, and you know is there something else that's coming up that you know uh, someone here in this group can contribute to? Yeah, absolutely. Um... For building the staker in public, uh, so yeah, so right now my role, uh, I'm an entrepreneur in residence at a, at a venture fund called Paradigm. And um, essentially I've, I've tried a couple of things that are just like big far out there ideas that I've had of like things that I think would be cool. And those things can take, very often it can be hard to get a first release out for those things. So I also like to balance them with things that I know uh, Paradigm portfolio companies definitely need help with. Um, Basically, like some ideas have a lot of market risk. Some ideas don't have any market risk. And it's really fun to work on ideas that don't have market risk. It's so nice where if like, it's rare that um, if you build something, you can be sure that people will use it. And that's the thing that I like most about the Uniswap staker. Uh, the fact that it was clear that if this existed, people would use it. So that was probably one of the main motivators. Um, building it in public, it's something that's really cool about Ethereum development because it's, it's like, well, by default, you want to build stuff in public. Um, building stuff in private in uh, for Ethereum sometimes can have its its merits, but for something like this, it's kind of a part of a big community. It makes a lot more sense to build it uh, in public because you want other people to make sure that it's secure. You want other people to contribute, and it's also just a lot more fun that way. So, when in doubt, if possible, build stuff in public. And is there is there any any new project that's coming up? You know what's what's next after Uniswap V3 Staker? Yeah, absolutely. So as far as I know, the Uniswap team uh, they are working on the front end for it. Um, it's going to become uh, a part of the main Uniswap web app. I'm not sure what the timeline is for it, but I know that it's something that they are thinking about quite a bit. It's it's kind of fun. There are actually a couple of other projects that have launched uh, some tokens on it. Um, I get these like DMs every now and then from these projects that I've never heard of that say like, yeah, we're using this contract. Like one of the most rewarding things is actually people reaching out and having like extremely specific questions. Like I had this person who I'd never heard of on Twitter ping me a couple of days ago and they asked this extremely esoteric like integer math question about the Unisoft staker and stuff like that is super rewarding. That's another reason to build in public. Uh, stuff coming up. Yeah, I have a couple of things right now. Um, right now I'm working on something that has a lot to do with uh, it's, it's like if you had a trifecta of like uh, cybersecurity risk, credit default swaps, and uh, doing stuff on Ethereum, that's sort of the next thing that I'm thinking about. Um, I, I, I sort of told everyone it's really important to get to uh, time to first release. And it's like they say the advice we give others is the advice we're trying to give ourselves. I've been kind of working on this, kind of thinking about it and kind of figuring out how to market it for the past like six weeks now. So I should release it sooner and uh, I will definitely make it public when, when it is ready, hopefully in the next few weeks. Yeah, sounds good. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, I mean, you mentioned about uh, Uniswap V3 uh, uh, Staker UI, right? So, uh, I mean, if you remember, uh, I mean, we had discussed about using, you know, subgraphs and I think Uniswap V3 team decided to, you know, go other route, right? So I mean, it'll be, you know, interesting to, I mean, this group to know, I mean, when should, you know, when should we use subgraphs for building UIs and, you know, uh, uh, and what are the alternatives? Uh, uh, yeah, I think it's, I mean, uh, and uh, the folks had a query around that uh, again yeah. during the session. Definitely, definitely. Um, so there, there are a couple of different ways to answer it. I think the, the simplest answer that I have is that uh, subgraphs work for us. We don't work for subgraphs. Essentially what that means is that like a lot of projects like to have subgraphs, but the most important thing is to say like, what will other people be able to do if the subgraph existed? Um, I think that an alternative, like one reason why people make subgraphs is because people want to make uh, Web3 apps and they want to, um, they don't want to like maintain their own backend. So it makes sense to do it. So I think that when possible subgraphs are great. Um, I think that if you, they take a little bit of like a time investment to get right, just because I know that there's like a specific way you have to do it. So 
I think it really depends on the project and how, uh, hmm. No, so, so I, so yeah. I think, I think Moody had uh, mentioned that, uh, 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 I mean, I don't know what his, what his first name is, but you know, Moody Salem in, on, mm -hmm. on GitHub. So he had mentioned that, you know, there were some issues with syncing up with, uh, with the graph sub, sub graph. So mm. they decided to, you know, use logs. So, uh, ah, I see, I see. Um, yeah. So there are a couple of things. So one of, so one of them is actually a very, very technical answer, which is when, yeah. So it's like when designing smart contracts in general, if you are doing something that, uh, that, that mutates the state, it's, it's generally uh, a good practice to emit an event, right? Uh, with ERC-20, for example, there's like the transfer event. With ERC-721, you have like all of its like specific events. We might have had some things in the staker that may or may not have emitted uh, events always. So I think that's something that maybe we could have done better if, 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 if that is an issue. Um, so it's like a broad uh, smart contract design thing. I think that when it comes to actually using subgraphs, in some cases, like ultimately, when you do put something on, on the graph, you are sort of uh, uh, making yourself dependent on their ability to keep their services up and running. Um, I know that in the past, they've had some issues with, uh, with, with site reliability engineering and downtime and whatnot. Um, so yeah, I think it's probably good to like try as a first thing. I don't think it makes sense to roll your own, you know, like graph service, you know, on day one, but Again, ultimately, like if you're using something and uh, it doesn't, uh, I don't know, it's like not fulfilling the need that you have. There we go. Yeah. It's like if something is broken, you can make it better or you can either and, or, or, or be okay with it. So that's sort of how I think of it. I think that the graph is an excellent service. I think that they're doing something that like a lot of people, it's, it's like kind of tricky to do. It's like do the thing that they want to do. So I think it's a great service, but I don't know if it goes down too much that I think at that point, it makes sense to kind of like roll your own um, and do it your own way. All right, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, Sammy? Hey, Omar, I really love the talk. Um, I, I like how positive your mentality is it's about kind of the constant mental battle that is building things. And I think it's, it's a really interesting way to look at the world. Um, you talked a lot about kind of like when you encounter obstacles when you're building things that you can either view like this infrastructure problem as a problem or an opportunity to build something new and better. So I'm wondering what are kind of the most exciting opportunities you've seen or, or in the dev tool space or in the infrastructure space in general for Ethereum that uh, probably a lot of people here want to build and make better. Definitely, definitely. Um... I'm trying to think of a good answer to the to the question, but what I think I can probably answer better is like the meta question, um, because I could say like I'm trying to think of like something. Um, I think it would be really cool. For for example, um, whenever uh, I compile something and I get a bunch of bytecode, it would be cool if there was a better way for me to kind of like highlight the bytecode and see specifically what it's doing. Uh, sort of like this example that that, that, I, that I sort of walked through. Like, I, I think it would be cool if there was something where I could just like highlight this and, you know, see specifically what it's doing. That would be interesting. It would be cool if there was like a stack visualizer. It would be cool if it showed uh, every single step of what the machine was doing. I don't think that someone other than me is going to build it unless that other person also feels that it's a problem or that person actually feels the problem of not having that, right? Um, to do, cause like in order to build something like this, like, it's like, we, we think step one is going to be, oh yeah, like kind of like rebuild the EVM, but step one is going to be like, you know, fight, you know, yarn or node modules or something like that. And the only way to really get through that, like, um, difficulty is by like really wanting the thing to exist. So to, to finally like answer the question, what I would say is I would like figure out like, what is the thing that like only like you, only you wish existed, make that exist. And then success is just like building that for yourself and whether other people use it, that's, you know, really cool as well. But I think the primary goal should be like, just make a really, really badass like Swiss army knife for yourself. That's the only thing you really need to do. And like, if you do that a couple of times and you share with other people, like it's, it's great to get feedback, but as long as you are building something that you think is cool, like that's like, I think that's probably the, the best way to figure out what to work on. Very Zen answer. 
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, cause eventually it's, yeah, it's, yeah. I don't know. It's like, it, there's always going to be like a new tool. There's always going to be a new language. There's always going to be like a new pattern. There are always going to be like a thousand medium posts of like, Oh, you know, truffle isn't cool anymore. You know, what's cool. Ganache or hard hat is cool. And then like someone will make like, like some, you know, the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And all that is always going to change. It's just like a continue. It's like an infinite loop, but yeah. The thing that sticks around is like what you think is cool. And as long as there's something that you think is interesting, like that's exactly where you should be. Awesome. Akash? Sorry, I'm here for round two, Omar. Um, I'm curious, uh, you, you kind of talking about building in public and, you know, with COVID, we've kind of to work from home and kind of be a little bit distant from a lot of other people. Maybe this is a personal preference question, but what do you, do you like working like remotely and working kind of virtually with other people? Or did you prefer, I assume when you were at Coinbase, you were primarily working in person. What do you, what, what do you like better? And what do you think is more effective for building quickly? Yeah. Um, I think that you can, so, so something that, that I've learned in the past couple of months is that you can, you can fall in love with a strategy or you can fall in love with an outcome, but it's really hard to like love both and achieve both at the same time. Like, I think it's possible to say, I like, I want to build something new and like, I'll do it the best way possible. Or I really want to like go, I really want to like like I don't know traverse this avenue I, I specifically want to like go in this direction and like I'll see where I end up I think as far as building things I think there are pros and cons to both of them um I think that it is nice to be like in an office like when like a lot of the core core projects that I did at Coinbase that really marked my time there a lot of those things were like us booking a conference room for like three weeks um and kind of being there from like 9 a.m. to like 11 p.m. every single day and the room like reeked of pizza and like diet coke cans everywhere because we were just like nonstop focused on that one thing and it was really 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 fun but at the same time the people in that room were the best people at coinbase to be in that room right so that was great and i think coinbase has a really good hiring process and i think that they're very good at attracting good crypto people the cool thing about doing stuff in a distributed way remotely on telegram is that it's not just the best people like around you. It's like you could you can attract the best people in the world and you can collaborate with them. You don't have to be in the same geography. You don't have to be in the same room. You can all you know check in from different places. I think that each one comes with uh, its own challenges. Like I think being able to write well is a lot more important when everybody is distributed. I think it's a lot more important to like uh, it's it's a little bit harder like to to manage a project, manage a team in a distributed way, but I think for each one, there are pros and cons. And I think the most important thing is to really ask yourself, like, what is it we're actually trying to achieve here? Are we trying to like, explore something? Um, in which case it's actually, sometimes it's better. Personally, I think it's better when you're just exploring something, just doing experiments. It's probably better to be in the same place. But if you know, like specifically where you want to go, it's just executing. And I think in that case, it's actually a little bit easier to execute when, when fully distributed. But that's just my view, and it could be it could be totally wrong. But that's that that that's what I believe right now. Thank you. We'll take one more question from Julian. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, my question is that uh, you have mentioned you know opportunities that you find interesting. Um, I was just wondering if you could suggest a direction or so that you think could be fruitful. I know, for example, like I thought about pursuing flash loans and I look in some places and then people say, oh, it's hard and all the opportunity is gone and so forth. So if you could start, you know, Greenfield to recommend an area to explore, what would you say? Yeah, so I'm going to give you like a, like a non-answer answer, answer, but I think it's the right answer, which is, um, are, are you familiar with the, uh, the efficient market hypothesis? Yes. Okay. Um, for, for, for those in the group who, who might not be familiar, the efficient market hypothesis will, will say that um, like in the stock market, all of the information that there is to be had about a certain stock is already reflected in the price. 
Um, therefore, there's like no alpha to be generated. There are no like opportunities that are there. And I used to believe in that quite a bit. And I used to believe the same thing about ideas. I used to think to myself, like, if something is done, it's because it could be done. And if something isn't done, it's either because it's too hard or it's not possible. That's like, in my, in my opinion, one of the most like self-limiting beliefs out there. Um, I think that if something is too challenging, um, that's because there hasn't been someone who's interested in it enough to overcome those challenges. Someone hasn't shown up who's like actually willing to grit through all like the difficulties and nonsense and node modules and you know waiting for build systems to go but like if there is someone who's interested enough in it that person will just blow through all that nonsense and just make something that's really really epic i think that in general there is some efficiency there like i think that um we're like a six month or a 12 month time horizon okay but remember like 12 months ago, Bitcoin was trading at like $8,000 or maybe it was 12 or 18 months ago. Like like in recent memory, Bitcoin was trading at $8,000. Now it's at like $50,000. So there is quite a bit to be had. Um, I think that if, if you were asking me this question about like enterprise software or like SaaS or something, I would say you have to think about like what the market needs and what you're interested in and find like the Venn diagram. But like, this is such a greenfield, greenfield still that like, I would say it's like 99%, what do you think is cool? 1%, what do you think the market really, really needs? Um, and I think it's important to, to decide like for some project, whether your goal is to like learn, to, like, like, like build something cool or like learn to do something versus to like ship something for the world. Um, yeah, I, I feel like it's, I have a very hard time um, with like the MBA model of coming up with ideas, which is like, let me make a spreadsheet of like a hundred ideas and rank them by these criteria. Um, cause I'll do that. And then I'll get bored of doing that. Then I'll just start hacking on this one, you know, this one thing on the side, just to take a break from making the spreadsheet. That's the thing that like you should be doing is like the thing that you do when you don't want to be doing anything else. Um, I think if you pursue that, like crypto is still growing quickly enough, there's still so much to be done. There's still so much railroad that still needs to be laid that like, the biggest risk is to like lose interest and burn out. As long as you hedge against that, you hedge against that by working on cool stuff, you'll, you'll, you'll do pretty well. Amazing. That's a really good way to end it. Um, thank you, Omar. This was really, really inspirational. A bunch of people said they were super inspired by the talk. Um, thank you for all your wisdom and insight. Um, and if anyone wants to reach out to you, um, can they do that in any, in any way? Yeah. Absolutely. I'll, um, yeah, I would, yeah, more than happy to give this chat. Um, I, I, I feel like the advice we give uh, again, like, like, like I'm, I'm saying all this stuff, this is probably advice that like, I'm trying to tell myself as well. So yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm super, yeah, super, super into this stuff. Um, I feel like this is like the mentality is the only thing that stays constant because everything else changes, but just like the headspace we approach problems with is key. Um, I just dropped my uh, email and my Twitter in the chat. Uh, feel, feel free to reach out. Um, and yeah, more, more than happy to chat. Thanks, Omar. Appreciate it. Yep. Absolutely. Thanks, right. everyone. Have a good day.